because of technology or anything else. It's just I refused to end that uh, radio show ad until I was happy with it. And I think I got more help from the chat room on this particular radio show than ever before. Um, and I have probably 10 to 15 unanswered emails from people keeping me up to date on Circo, on uh, United, on the Shanghai and New York Stock Exchange. And the fact that uh, Circo, United, and uh, another industry or two are probably going to have a difficult time uh, keeping their head above water. Meanwhile, I wait for David while I masticate. Hmm, yum, yum. Sunshine, something seems up. Yeah, it is. We have our finger on the pulse. Or for people that like Beatles music, when I put my finger on your trigger. Hmm. Hey, George, are you there? Let me check. I might be going down to Atlanta tomorrow to get the hearse, and then again, I might not. Let's see if George is here. Well, we got quite a smattering of people. Yes, we do have a George. Well, let's see if Swamper's here, because a Swamper Mama's here. Freeport Girl's here. Swamper Mama is not here. Okay. Then I, I'm sure Taco's going to jump on this. Um, would somebody please go to FlightAware, or whatever it's called, that website where you can watch the progress of flights? and uh, try to find out how late United Flight 214 is today. Meanwhile, since the 6th of December of 2006, we've been Googling our cut side. And of course, since the 14th of February of 1967, I've been monitoring my sister's evil. That's a true statement, sadly. Hmm. David H. is here. David H. is calling. Don't believe me? Watch. Okay, he's on. Of course we are. Otherwise, I would have I would have answered, or you would have queried me. Wait a minute, I don't. You went to boy school, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I don't want you querying me then. Okay, let's go with Protocol Twenty Seven, Charlie. Are you seated down and clear of mind? Yep. Are you mentally lucid? Probably more than you, but no. Let's not be competitive. Of course not. And the reason you say that is because you hate coming in second. Okay, here we go with the ringy dingies. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Hello, your eminence. Hello, your effluence. And I'm going to go to the chat room and see if his irrelevance is here. And do you know who it is that goes by the handle of his irrelevance? No. Dirty driveway. And don't blow his cover by saying David Donaway. Okay, over to you for some of that smart stuff. Okay, now I just want to do some backgrounding. Did I teach you what an acronym was, Phil? Over to you. Yes, an acronym is a mint that you put on the tongue of an acron. Uh, of course, an acron is a person who lives in the same state as the um, Cleveland Cavaliers, not to be Cavalier or flippant. Uh, and dare I say, I'm not uh, laconic either. I, I'm having. So, David, yes, an acronym is a mint that people in Akron use to keep the, the smell of steel, rust, ferrous oxide, and uh, coal out of their nostrils. Over to you. Yeah, excellent. Now, that's one definition, somewhat metaphorical. Hang on, I'm getting back here. Why would you be getting an echo? Second. I don't know. OK, it's disappeared. OK. I got an acronym for you, Field, and I'd love you to tell me how clever I am, or at least how you managed to radiate that from your mouth. 
It's the acronym S-C-R-A-P, which according to my pronunciation spells out SCRAP. And SCRAP is Sheraton Clinton's remotely assassinated pilot. Didn't you say you were going to ask me what it was? Uh, well, I, my memory is fading, yes. So I think you must have told me metaphorically or telepathetically. Yeah, and by the way, don't say scrap. They'll figure us out. What we have to say is S crap. S space C R A P. Are you familiar with C R A P? Uh, well, I'm not excessively familiar. It depends when my bowel movements are, either before or after breakfast. Well, um, it's interesting you're English because uh, John Crapper was the guy who invented the flushable toilet. Were you aware of that? Yes. Well, that's why instead of saying scrap, which could confuse people, because some people say a scrap is a fight or a, a riot or a furball. A furball is fighter pilot talk for a fight involving airplanes. And I would say that today the Phantom Flight is defeating the Circo Flight, and the sun appears to have set on Circo, uh, some Shanghai issues, and... Uh, well, I don't, the word isn't in yet, at least to me. Let me go to the chat room and see if anybody's monitoring. Uh, I want to know what time United 214 is landing uh, and how late it is. Somebody has United 219, which is great, but the flight I'm concerned with is United 214. Uh, so if anybody can go to FlightAware or one of those websites where they monitor flights, it would be interesting to see if United 214 just happens by sheer coincidence to be 71 minutes late. Over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So what I've done with the today's post radiated from your mound is identify the role of Hillary Clinton uh, and the Sheraton Hotels in the remote assassination of civilian and military pilots. So I'll read the first paragraph. I've popped it in the chat room. Sheraton Hotels and Clinton Foundation guests are allegedly engaged in remotely controlled assassination of pilots who might otherwise expose the scripts of phony war games staged for corrupt politicians by the Department of Defense's partnership for peace. Classic example of that is, of course, the rehearsal of Amalgam Virgo on the 1st and 2nd of June, where they set up opportunities for the remote assassination of pilots who would otherwise expose the spurious, bogus and phony script used to bring down aircraft such as TWA-800. Now, my guess is, Field, that that rehearsal on the 1st and 2nd of June had already identified uh, pilots who might represent a threat to these phony war games. One of them had been taken care of, and that's John Bennett Ramsey. Now, he was taken care of not by killing him, but by killing his daughter in a manner with a level of gratuitous cruelty that's almost imaginable, but quite reasonable for the lesbian pedophiles that surround your sister and Hillary Clinton in Washington. And, of course, the intriguing thing about that is that we now know the backhauled snuff film images could only have been backhauled in real time through packet switching clocked by the onion router. Now, the onion router was developed by the United States Navy Research Labs in 19 or by 1996. 
and the United States Navy was in fact communicating between its, I think they might be called capital ships, using the onion router in a manner that made it almost impossible for the enemies of the United States Navy to eavesdrop. That, of course, didn't sit well with the Clintons. Because not only did they want to, their friends to eavesdrop into the United States Navy, they wanted essentially to dismantle the United States Navy as a means of delivering force in the interests of the Republic. David, stop right there. Thank you. Um, when James Webb was Secretary of the Navy, let's just assume the Navy of the United States had 600 ships. Knowing how the skinny mulatto is sent here by his crown sponsors to destroy the United States of America, which he can't get done. He doesn't even know which way a rifle points. Um, anyway, the skinny mulatto is sent here to destroy our military potency. Do you have any idea how many ships are in the Navy today, David? It's about half of that, isn't it? Very good. It is. It's just a little less than half. So... Um, I'm, I pardon to interrupt, but it's very important that people understand this if they understand nothing else. Uh, Barack Obama doesn't exist. His name is Barry Swatero. He's been groomed since the 80s, if, if not earlier, and I believe his grooming started at the East West Center at the University of Hawaii in the late 60s. Uh, and he's been groomed to be the closing act on the United States of America. Uh, I have two words for him, David. Can you anticipate what either one of them is? Turn your mic on and try again. F.O.? Yep, you're right. Over to you, David. Well, you might enjoy the playing with the letters, again, in an acronym, uh, Partnership for Peace, because that's PFP. What does PFP bring to mind in your uh, world field? Over to you. Um, purple blanking pants, or it also brings to mind PFT, which is not P, but I'm allowed to have a little leniency when you're pressing me for specific answers. PFT is a physical fitness test, and if you're wondering if I ever cheated on one, well, yes, I, I cheated once at the Naval Academy where I sat out laps five, six, and seven uh, in a latrine watching my classmates run around the uh, track uh, three extra laps compared to me, but we all got the same credit for passing. And the other time that I, some, some purist would say I cheated on PFT is when I was uh, temporarily assigned at Midway Island, which is uh, about, well, I think it's around a thousand miles northwest of Honolulu. And I was there for Operation Pony Express. I didn't make that up. Google it, Operation Pony Express. 1974, you, if you, if the information's out there, you'll see that I was there in a KC-130F from El Toro, and there was a queer A3, which means QA3, uh, and the aircraft commander of that was Mike Clark, who was a tight end on the Naval Academy football team. He's dead, I'm not. So David, a PFP, yes, Partnership for Peace. Uh, what's another way of defining that? Uh, PF's partnership. Okay. You PF, you, you're talking about the type of uh, pig blankers? Yeah. Yeah, well, these people trying to destroy America are nothing more than a bunch of frustrated PFers, and they're not going to get it done. Uh, and how are they not going to get it done? Well, because it hasn't been blessed. It hasn't been ordained, and it ain't going to happen. David, over to you. And we have a remedy, which is to detach the PFA's partnership from the precise timing signals associated with the onion router clock in the custody of circuit. So in one fell swoop, we'll come to that perhaps later, the United States Navy could take back control over its onion router, which it developed and deployed around the world in the interest of the Republic, and say that anyone who attempts to use the onion router network in a man in the middle attack on the United States of America is, I think the technical term is unlawful belligerent. And with unlawful belligerence field, they fall outside the Geneva Convention 
and you can arrest them and shoot them. Great. And I believe that Hillary Clinton and your sister were party together with Darlene Druin. Do you remember the name Darlene Druin? Over to you. She was the ugly lesbian that arranged for the um, E-10 drone to be used in place of American 11 on the morning of 9-11. And the reason they had a couple of spare drones around was Boeing's marketing department was doing a horrid job back then selling the United States Air Force on the needs to have an E-10, which is an electronic warfare aircraft. And it was at the same time that John McCain treason this little bastard that he is, was trying to get <clears throat> Airbus tankers to replace Boeing tankers. And let me just, I rarely do this, but there's one reason why McCain wanted Airbus tankers. If you can control the flow of gas to a fighting force, you shut them down, period. David, over to you. Turn the mic on. Yeah, you're right. So by exactly the same token, if you control the flow of gas into the USS Cole and force it to fuel up in Aden Harbor, you can blow up the most advanced frigate in the United States Navy. And basically that serves to humiliate the white, Caucasian, heterosexual uh, officers in the United States Navy, who I'm sure are, are, are perfectly competent but they don't know or can't recognize a man or a woman in the middle attack from inside the government itself or inside the Pentagon. And a classic example of that, of course, was Darlene Drew, and she went to jail. But of course, uh, she was, I believe, uh, an unlawful belligerent, and she should have been taken out, put in front of a military tribunal and shot. You know what I'd say? Brett, you know, shooting, uh, there's a shortage of ammunition in this country, and, and shooting's a little loud. Would you mind if I just stabbed her with my Marine Corps sword? No, I think that would be perfectly appropriate, Phil. Yeah, I'm not a very good stabber, so it may, might take 30 or 45 thrusts before I finish her off. Let me say that again. 45 thrusts before I finish her off. David, over to you. Okay, second paragraph in today's post. In 1998, former patent lawyer Hillary Clinton allegedly equipped the PFP. That's, we could call that the PFS partnership. Yep. Or uh, as it's known within the government, the Partnership for Peace, which basically allies with the blessing of the useless parasites in the Department of Defense, the NATO command and control system with a whole bunch of loser countries that got spun off from the old Soviet Union together with their counterintelligence forces, which have been committed to the destruction of the United States since the days of Stalin, Trotsky, and Lenin at the Whitechapel Toynbee Hall in 1904. Of course, they were probably buggering little boys with the help of British intelligence, if that's not a misnomer. And uh, these people were, of course, had fallen into the pedophile entrapment network built by the British, and they did exactly what they were told to do over the next century, including, I think, killing about 50 million Russians because they're psychopaths. But anyway, in 1998, former patent lawyer Hillary Clinton allegedly equipped the PFP with the Navy's onion router, Tor, and formed SBA 8A companies into surrogate terrorist groups. Did I teach you what surrogate was, Phil? Yes, that um, <clears throat> someone carries the ovum, uh, the fertilized ovum, uh, that has been done in a petri dish, and an uh, example that most people around the world would be familiar with was the fact that um, Webster Hubble's DNA-rich fluid was mixed with uh, an ovum from somebody that uh, was, um, well, the somebody, I don't want to name her because Hillary Clinton might get upset. So I'll just say some ugly woman that's notori notoriously fat-assed and flat-breasted. Um, anyway, uh, they mixed, uh, what's his name, Webster Hubble's DNA-rich fluid and an ovum that allegedly came out of a cavernous bowel, and then it was put into a surrogate mother, carried for nine months, and voila, pretty soon we got uh, Chelsea Hubble. 
But is that your understanding of surrogate, David? Yeah, absolutely. Incredible precision field. Thank you. That's and my, for mes that's my yeah, forte, you know. <laughs> SBA 8 companies into surrogate terrorist groups, and you can call them, I don't know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Red Brigade, the Black Friday group, you know, every man and his dog. How about lump jaws losers? Yeah, lump jaw losers or um, PF as partnerships. Okay, and into PF, surrogate. Uh, PFP yeah. means partnership for pigs, according to George Holdsworth. Good. Yeah, I think he's right. Me too. Uh, or maybe sounds actually. And that wouldn't be PFP, would it? It would be PFS. Okay, pigs for sows is PFS. Got it. Yeah. Uh, companies into surrogate terrorist groups for the synchronized assassinations of pilots, in brackets, and selected passengers in the U.S. chain of command. You see, now if you want to do an assassination of a high-value target, let's say um, the wife of uh, the chief financial futures transaction at the top of the South Tower in the bombing of 911, and her name was, do you remember her name, Phil? Uh, I wasn't listening, so go ahead. I want to get this if I can. Go ahead and ask me the question again. Okay, the, the woman who went down in that QZ, whatever it was, 8501, after shaking hands with Barack Obama, do you remember her name? It wasn't QZ8501. Try again. Okay, I've forgotten the name. Try Colgan3407. Okay, and the name was? Beverly Eckert. Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. So Beverly Eckert, of course, potentially is a whistleblower. Now, killing her with an AK-47 in broad daylight might draw a bit of attention to the fact that she'd just shaken hands with Barry Sotaro. Hope she washed her so hands. Barry, yeah, I hope she did. So Barry, or little Barry as I like to call him, would have wanted to make sure that he was distanced or alienated from the whack job on uh, Beverly Ecker. Let me just stop you right there and demonstrate how fast we are and lethal, David. Listen to this. We're going to have a race between, well, a swamper's not here. So Agent 66 is here. Let's make sure Swamper's not here. No, Swamp Rat's here. We'll have a race between Swamper and 66. Ladies, you just heard David say something about alien. Um, I'll go get a sprinkled donut, and either 66 or Swamper can tell me what colored sprinkled donut to get. For the first one who puts up a, an image of my 96, no, it's 95, 1995 Cadillac limousine in front of Alien Technologies. And what I'd suggest trying first is going to Google Images and put in Alien plus Limousine plus Field McConnell plus Able Danger. Ready, set, go. Okay, David, sorry. Watch how fast this comes up. Right, so Beverly Ecker got whacked. And, of course, they didn't want the whacking of Beverly Ecker to ricochet back, if that's the right word, to little Barry, who had just shaken her hand. She was a potential whistleblower. That could have revealed the, a great deal about who was targeted and why on 911. Now, that means Barry would have turned to the Navy's onion router and set up what is known as online assassination betting, where Beverly Ecker was the named target. A whole bunch of people put in a whole bunch of money, presumably the investors or donors of the Clinton Foundation and guests of the various uh, Sheraton hotels that might have uh, entertained or hosted the passengers on that plane that Beverly Eckert went down. And they would have set up a online assassination betting pool where the party that was most accurate in predicting the time of Beverly Eckert's death would have scooped the pot and shared that with the bookmaker. And the whole process would have been, as I put it, eavesdrop proof because they would have had to have used the onion router technology of the U.S. Navy to prevent uh, eavesdropping. David, I got to interrupt. Remember I, I asked for an image of an alien limousine? Yes. It was up within 81 seconds. Okay, take a look at the image and then continue. I have to go get a donut in a minute, but I won't leave until I warn you that I'll be gone for a minute and a half getting a donut. 
Okay, well, I'm glad you brought alien, the word alien, into the discussion uh, because you will, of course, remember, Field, who was in charge of the 8 aid companies, the 7,000 lending banks, the $50 billion loan portfolio in 1998 when Hillary Clinton outsourced the operation of the onion router to Serco and Serco would have equipped the Partnership for Peace for ongoing attacks on the United States of America. So who was in charge in 1998, Field? In charge of what? I was busy responding to Swamper Mama. But in 1998, in charge of what? The Small Business Administration. Oh, my sister. Correct. Now, uh, prior to, and this comes back to the alien, I'll, then I'll go and deal with my dog, and I'm not going to put, have him put down because he's one of the few friends I've got in this world. Um, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I, not to correct you, I think he's the only friend, isn't he? <laughs> well, he's certainly the only friend. No, 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 my cat is also a good friend, so I've got two good four-legged friends, all right? Your cat? That near Perry. Yeah, well, she's got four legs. Yeah, but you don't use the color of cat. That's true. That's yeah, okay, true. but anyway, go ahead. Okay, so the word alien. So your sister founded the United States Justice Prisoner and Alien Transportation System called Conair, which allowed her to fly killers for the uh, the Sheraton Clinton remotely assassinated pilot conspiracy around the world to do the assassination and then duck back undercover, quite possibly, going back into jail where they can be supplied with little boys and little girls to keep them entertained. So your sister, of course, is an incredibly powerful, incredibly stupid woman who's about to meet her nemesis. Did I teach you nemesis over to you? Yes, a nemesis is that part of a uh, female's body. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's something else. Uh, yes, a nemesis. A nemesis is what I am to the cabal. Is that your final answer? It is until I get back with the white donut with pink sprinkles. Can you talk for a minute and a half while I go get Agent 66 or donut? Yes, I will continue and I will go now to the third paragraph. Okay, keep going. I'll be right back. Okay, uh, the third paragraph of today's uh, post, which I will pop into the chat room. And this relates to the assassination of the pilot. Presumably, he wasn't already dead, of course, of MH Flight 17. And I'd like some help with the chat room, maybe to explore the possibility that the pilot of MH Flight 17 was already dead when the plane crashed in East Ukraine. So on the 7th of, and now my computer has gone a wall. Let me just see. On seventeenth, on July the seventeenth, seventeen, July the seventeenth, two thousand and fourteen, Clinton eight A companies, mentored by Serco, allegedly used Tor clocks, that's the onion router clocks, on PFP aircraft, that's Partnership for Peace aircraft, to track the pilots of MH seventeen between the Sheraton hotels at Schiphol Airport in. Uh, Amsterdam, by Amsterdam, and Kuala Lumpur, and spot fix a crash a few seconds from the Rostov on Don waypoint designated RND. Now, one of the things I'd like to challenge the chat room or ask the chat room for help is I've been trying to identify the pilots of MH17 and I haven't been unable to. So I'm just wondering if they didn't want to name the pilots because the pilots had had a name change and a face change or something, so the pilots originally scheduled to go on MH17 weren't actually on that plane, and the possibility that MH17 was being flown through remote control by the PFP aircraft, the accompanying aircraft, and the bodies on MH17 included the body of the pilot of MH370. So let me just pop into the chat room and see if there's any takers for the challenge of identifying the pilots on MH17. I'm back, David. Yeah, Field. So what I was doing was trying to uh, see if the chat room was able to come up with the name of the pilots 
on MH17. There were no pilots on MH17. Well, uh, that's very interesting because who might have been a place boy or a place man for those pilots that should have been on the plane? Did you happen to look at today's radio show, Al? Yes. I posted his picture in there. Did you see it? Uh, yes. <laughs> the captain of Malaysia 370, his corpse was found in Donetsk. Yeah, and I'm very, I believe that's totally persuasive. And of course, what we put in today's post is please provide the DNA from the crime scene at Donetsk to identify the name of the pilot. And if they can't come up with a pilot who is proved to have died at that time, who was scheduled to go on that plane out of Amsterdam, I suggest we got circumstantial proof <coughs> that it was, in fact, the pilot of MH370 who had been murdered on Diego Garcia. Is that a plausible scenario? Almost. You say you think he was murdered on Diego Garcia. Yeah. Well, if you take a look at Bob S.'s picture of my Marine Corps sword, uh, right. my sword cuts both ways. Do you have any idea what that means, David? Uh, it's a double-edged sword? Yes, very good. And also, just for our people in the pastel gay community, just so they don't feel left out, this hole's for you. Um, this door swings both ways. It's marked north and south. No, it's this door swings both ways. It moves in and out. It'll take a warm wind or a cold one from the south. This door swings out both ways. It's marked left and right. Why don't you come over here and... <laughs> Sometimes people think too fast. But anyway, this is my donut, and I'd like to show our hands in the audience how many people in the chat room would like me to send this out to Agent 66 in Portland. Uh, that's one. So if you, if, you, if you think I should do that, please raise, raise your right hand. Okay, I see him. Uh, if you think I should eat this donut in front of the camera as a tribute to Agent 66, please raise your left hand. Oh, it was close, but... Uh, Looks like I'm going to eat this donut, David. Anyway, back to what you were saying, and I'm sorry I interrupted. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So Swamp Bar has actually put in a post about uh, the pilot of MH Flight 17, um, and it appears to be Captain Juan Amran. Uh, his ashes of Captain Eugene Chu were brought back to his residence in Serambam. Now, isn't that interesting? So the ashes of, I guess that might be the co-pilot, was brought back to his residence. And of course, ashes are a preferred method of making sure that no one can do a DNA analysis to identify the pilot. Now, he may have been killed in that plane. He may, in fact, have been killed elsewhere and then cremated and used as a proxy or a surrogate pilot. And we've covered the, as you did inimitably feel, the definition of the surrogate. Yes, uh, the surrogate. I have explained that before, but I could explain it again, but I'd rather enjoy a Cavendish and Harvey mixed fruit drops because they're curiously strong and they are the original and celebrated hard candy of choice uh, speaking of hard candy, David, do you think there's any type of a song by Dolly Parton that has the word hard candy in it? Uh, I think you're about to tell me there is. It's a hard candy Christmas. Anyway, maybe I'll go somewhere. Maybe I'll do my hair. Maybe I'll just get drunk on some cheap wine. It's a, mm, I'll be sad and lonely. It's a, Hard Candy Christmas. Anyway, that's a beautiful song by Dolly Parton, who's a beautiful person, and I'm not talking about her Bugatti headlights. I'm talking about what's between her ears and what is in the center of uh, her upper torso, which is a heart. Uh, good people could write bad lyrics, but bad people cannot write good lyrics. That's called the, the Pavlovian theory of hot sauce, and that's brought to us today by my crystal hot sauce uh, providers. 
which include a woman named Susan M. somewhere in Florida, I believe. Could be Louisiana, but I think it's Florida. And then, of course, the ever late on the hot sauce delivery person to whom I've just dedicated a pink sprinkled donut. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks. So, so now I'm going to be asking you uh, some technical, well, I'm going to ask you for your technical elucidation of the circumstances in which MH17 was crashed. Make sure you, this, make sure you quiz me about offset. Excellent. Uh, yeah, the, 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 in fact, the uh, newspaper article is entitled, or titled, Inquiry confirms MH17 was flying offset from airway. It's by a David Kaminsky Morrow from London, and it's dated 9th of September. Uh, and it says, and I'll just drop it into the chat room as we go, and then perhaps you could comment on the paragraphs as I drop them in. Dutch investigators have confirmed that Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 had been flying an onset course, offset course, from its airway before the Boeing 777 broke up after sustaining multiple high energy impacts. Do you have any comments on that, Phil? Yes, I think it sounds like they're talking about the resultant vector analysis that might happen when someone has too many smoked oysters and then downs three or four NDSU, Rodney Balding, or Extendo Peters. But are you asking me about aviation or physiology? Uh, aviation. And was your question about offset? Yes. Okay. While I masticate my donut, I'll take my donut bag and I will demonstrate. And you're not watching on camera, right, David? So I have to explain it to you while I draw it up yes. for everybody else? Okay. Yes. First, I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw a line between A and B. And then I'm going to have another waypoint C. So here we have uh, Ukraine on the morning uh, and the mid-afternoon of 17 August, 20, 17 July of 2014. A, B, and C. Okay. If the course between A, B, in fact, David, so it looks like you're smart too. Do you know the name of the airway between A and B? Between A and B, no. Okay, because let me see. You're, you never read. Let me see here. L980. David, you don't learn that I'll never ask you a question you can't answer. The cancer is right before you. But anyway, it's right before me. So that's your tongue lashing du jour. Okay, between A and B, uh, MH17 was supposed to proceed on uh, airway Lima 980. For some reason, and I know what the reason was, I'm going to I'm going to do delta 30, and then I'm going to do the formation of delta 30. Uh, anyway, here's what happened. There's a second line, David, that now is north of the direct route between A and B. And the conversation went something like this. Um, the first voice you hear is Kiev Air Traffic Control. Uh, Malaysia 17, can you climb to flight level 350? David, you play the part of Malaysian drone. And what did the Malaysian drone say to the controller? Uh, no. That's right. Or in pilot talk, negative, we're unable to climb to 350, too heavy. Uh, Roger, Malaysia 370, offset 30 north, offset 30 left of track, 30 miles north for converging traffic over Bravo, which is B. So what he's saying is, since you PFers are too lazy or too heavy to climb to 350 and you got another 777 bearing down on you on a reciprocal course from B to A, since you can't climb, then we're going to force you to offset. And he, you heard the, con the controller say, offset 30 north. That's not 30 degrees, it's 30 miles. And uh, he also said offset left. It's amazing, and I'm not making this up, but sometimes they'll have to direct you both with north, south, and left, right, because people get confused. I know I've been confused. In fact, maybe I'm confused now or I'm confusing you. But one thing about a donut, you should never eat the whole because it'll leave you with an empty feeling. After they offset from, from Alpha to Bravo, they offset at 30 north. And here's the original course. And then 30 north, 30 left, because they were heading east, would be up here. Once they're on that course, do you remember what happened, what the air traffic controller then told them to do? Uh, no. Yes, I'll never ask you a question you don't know the answer, and you know the answer to this. Let me see if it's printed there. 
Uh, do to do, do that's David Beach, David H. Yeah, they see you're going along right with me. Execute the climb in order to avoid traffic conflict with another triple seven. Uh, MH crews unable to comply. Da, 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 da. Okay, we haven't got okay. I'm gonna read the next one. MH was still 3.6, I said 30 miles, they say 3.6 left of the airway just before 1620 when uh, the center instructed the flight to proceed directly to Rostov and Don. Okay, that's point C. Okay, so what happened was right here at 1620, I'll put it in ink so I can't change it later. 1620, the center said, Malaysia 17, proceed direct to Romeo November Delta, read back. Okay, so then if you're the pilot, what would you say, David? Uh, don't want to. No, you'd say, Roger, proceeding direct, present position, Romeo November Delta. And then they go on their merry way, right up until about 35 minutes past the hour. And even though I predicted that they would blow up by 7 p.m. on the 17th of July, and if anybody at the chat room has not seen written proof that I did in fact predict this crash, and I predicted it on the 29th of March of 2014 before I went to Malaysia, uh, according to our calculations, 15 minutes after this, uh, the aircraft, which is now even further north, of course, uh, was blown out of the sky manually after the explosives that were supposed to take it out had been inerted by the blocking of a KU band transmission. David, over to you. Right. Now, the next uh, paragraph or paragraphs in that is that this was the last transmission from the airport just seven seconds before the cessation of the cockpit voice and flight data recorders, a few seconds after 1620. Dnipropetrovsk control tried to inform MH17 to expect a direct clearance to the Tikna, T-I-K-N-A waypoint, but its crew did not respond. The controller telephoned Rostov Center asking whether it had contact with MH17 but was told, no, it seems that its target, underlined its target, started falling apart. I wonder what the expression of the voice was in talking about the target falling apart. At the time of the occurrence, the aircraft was flying in unrestricted airspace under control of air traffic control, following the route and flying the altitude as cleared by ATC, says the inquiry. Three other commercial aircraft had been overflying the same airspace, which had been closed below 32,000 feet at the time. The inquiry says the closest of these was 30 kilometers. Now, I'm not sure if I get the hang of all of this field, <coughs> but it, to me, it appears that the plane was diverted into a trap set up by the PFs for peace either directly or indirectly, indirectly in the control of the Clinton Foundation guests in Sheraton hotels along the route. At the start of that route <laughs> would be the Sheraton Hotel at Sheepold Airport. The end of the route would have been the Sheraton Hotel in Kuala Lumpur. So my question to you, Field, is does what has been described there fit with the idea that this plane was remotely hijacked and flown to a waypoint for an encounter perhaps with a missile or a bomb on board that would precisely define the time of death of the two pilots and everyone on board the plane. Over to you. Well, it would appear to, but of course it was not because everybody on the airplane was dead before it departed. Whether it departed Schiphol or whether it departed Kuala Lumpur, doesn't matter at this point <clears throat> because they can change the records. Who are they? Well, a lot of people can change the records. The FAA, the NTSB, uh, ICAO in Montreal. Uh, some of us may recall that when Kenya 507 went down on the 5th of May of 2007 on a route from Cameroon to Nairobi, um, for some strange reason, the black boxes, which of course are orange, and uh, you notice when I said black box, I didn't say anything about some missing children in Chicago. Um, but the black box is aboard uh, Kenya Airways 507, which down, went out on the 5th of May of 07, 
uh, the orange black boxes. I, I can't say that enough. It just seems so groovy. Orange black boxes. Oh, gee, are they trying to confuse us? Well, they can confuse us most of the people most of the time, but they can't confuse us ever. Um, yeah, I'll stick by that. I don't think we've been confused often, have we, David? Turn the mic on and say yes. Uh, no, never feel, but, except I'm confused by you, but that's part of the game, right? Oh, this is no game. This is a divine ordination. Uh, the, the, the millennial battle between good and evil is underway, and it's not, it's not called Jade Helm or Geo Int. It's called Christine McCart, uh, whatever her name is, Christine Marcy versus Blabbermouth, her little brother. And guess what? Uh, the lesbian loses. Not because it's a lesbian, but because it is a servant of Satan. And do you know the name Dirty Driveway, David? Let's go through this again. Turn on microphone and say yes. Yes. Very good. <clears throat> Dirty Driveway told me that he thought I would be, uh, I would get a lot more attention if I would stick to the skullduggery of the evil without referencing the Bible. But you know what? Uh, I'm not really, I'm, I'm unpredictable, but I'm, I'm 10 times more uh, unmanageable. But let me tell you what I can manage to do. I can manage to see exactly what happened. Uh, to Malaysia 370 because it was aircraft 9M hyphen MRO. It was the B777 that had landed at uh, Diego Garcia. And when I corrected you earlier, I said, you're almost right. You said something about the bodies, the humans being killed on Diego Garcia, correct? Yes or no? Yes. I truly believe, and at this point it'll never be proven, I truly believe the bodies of the 239 humans, which was 227 passengers and 12 crew members aboard ill-fated 9M hyphen MRO, when it got up to BITOD intersection and then it started to reverse course back towards the Malaysia landscape, uh, it was doing that because flight plan two uh, had been put in the FMS, flight management system remotely. And when flight, when, uh, it, when the BUAP was triggered remotely and, and flight plan two was Uplink, uplinked or uploaded, your choice. <clears throat> the first two things that happen when you turn on the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot is the transponder goes blank and the communications radios. How many communication radios are there? Well, there's VHF, there's HF, there's ACARS. Uh, who knows, there could be other things too. There's those pesky little pingers in the Rolls-Royce Trent engines that continued to transmit data all the way to a 0651 touchdown at Diego Garcia. But the aircraft was hijacked first by Serco, I believe, and if Serco objects to that, uh, call me. It's uh, International Code 001-715-307-8222. And just to make sure my phone's working, because it would sure be a shame if somebody of important at Serco like Solms if he tried to call me and I couldn't take the call. So hopefully somebody will call my number, 715-307-8222, and make sure my phone rings. Uh, and I promise not to answer it. But I, I wanted to correct you. I believe that after the first hijacking, when Serco took the aircraft, I believe they also, uh, at the time that the transponder and radios are shut down automatically, the ATI is armed automatically. That doesn't mean it's deployed, but it's armed so that it can be deployed. What does the ATI do? It introduces colorless, tasteless... Hang on, David. That's Hawaii Five O. Uh, the person that called, I can't, uh, I can't tell you who sh she was, but uh, if you read fiction at all, or friction or faction, 
if you read what I write, you might be able to find a image. In fact, let's do this. I'll take another bite out of this donut in, in respect to whoever puts up an image. The image you, I think my phone's ringing again. Okay, this is Freeport Girl. This is hilarious. David, you don't see the value in this, do you? Uh, in, in, in unfathomable. But the value is, I just told Circo, Soames, Satan, Soames, Circo, Sotero, uh, that he can call me if he doesn't like my saying that Circo took the aircraft. Uh, and I'll, I'll go in one further, because before you make that call, Mr. Fat Boy, uh, you might know that there's an attorney. <laughs> David, did you just make a noise? I just inadvertently poked in the eye of the dog because I was trying to remove a booger. You say you were trying to booger your dog? No, remove a booger. You know what wait, yeah, wait a minute. You're offending everyone in North America, except Brits. Most people aren't that vulgar. So why don't you just say you were trying to help the dog when you inadvertently poked him in the eye? Yes, okay. I tried to help the dog. In, uh, when I, what was that word? Big word? That's a big word for you. Uh, inadvertently. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, anyway, the value of having those ringtones go off, it proves a couple things. It proves I'm not calling myself. It proves my phone does work, and it proves that I'm accessible. Uh, so if, if uh, Circo wants to avoid hitting the 71 threshold by... This might be Mr. Soames now. It appears people like this new ringtone I have, David. Do you recognize that song? Uh, no. Uh, well, this is a granny calling me. Uh, and do you think I'm talking about a grandmother? Uh, no. <clears throat> this call just came from... Uh, Wisconsin, somewhere near Whitehall, Wisconsin, and as you remember, the lesbian from Whitehall that married a pompous ass, uh, <clears throat> I can't remember her name now, she went to Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, and she's a raging lesbian, and she's married to that guy that still thinks he's running for president, he's got a really odd name, oh yes, Newt Salamander. So I've had three people call and prove that my phone works, so I think that's sufficient, and I was hoping somebody was going to put up an image of the Malaysian persuasion. And if anybody's trying to get that image, all you have to do to find it, while I scroll to see it's, yeah, it's not up yet. All you have to do is put in Able Danger plus Agent Chips plus Malaysian persuasion plus Pastel plus IOC. David, while I sit here and contemplate masticating my Pastel donut with, now my phone's going off again. David, over to you. Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks, Phil. So, just to do, time is racing, so let's do a little recap. The basic allegation in today's post is that Sheraton and the Clinton Foundation guests are engaged in remotely controlled assassination of pilots who might otherwise expose the scripts of war games staged for corrupt politicians by the Department of Defense's Partnership for Peace. So we have to be clear about when the Partnership for Peace was launched and by whom and why. Well, it was launched in 1996, formally, after a tour of Europe by the treasonous Bill Clinton. And what Bill Clinton wanted to do, of course, was to set up an organization with corrupt and failed state spin-offs of the old Russia and put together basically an intelligence or counterintelligence organization that could subvert the republic. So let's just pop in what he was up to in this period and who he was meeting into the chat room. And here goes. This is the role of Clinton, 20th century international relations, the role of NATO. This was planned to offer less formal partnerships for peace 
or PF is for peace, as you will, to form a Soviet bloc states, including Russia. So actually, Clinton set up a joint intelligence alliance to replace or compete or disrupt what is known as the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance dated from the Second World War. The Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance was the intelligence services of New Zealand and Australia and Canada and the United States and the United Kingdom. So who gave this clown authority to go to Europe and bring the Soviet bloc states, including Russia itself, into the Five Eyes Intelligence Network? Zygno Brzezinski. Quite possibly. The fact remains is that after that tour, Clinton saw an opportunity to subvert the Republic of the United States with people committed to its destruction. So he comes back from Europe, <clears throat> probably in January of 1994, and with his phony crony wife, sets up an 8A company in New Rochelle, Westchester County, called Base One Technologies. And that was registered or filed by the Department of State, Warren Christopher. And amazingly enough, this Base One Technologies company, this 8A company, it had the job at arm's length, or virtual arm's length from the Department of State, to set up what is known as honeypots. A honeypot is designed to attract so-called white hats and black hats into a fairly persuasive script so that the white hats can identify the black hats and kill them or subvert them or turn them. The big dilemma at having a rogue 8A company operating in Westchester County about 20, 20 minutes up the road from the Clinton home, which they bought in 1998, at Chappaqua, is that that base one technologies is going to have to follow orders from the Department of State or proxy secretaries of state to identify the white hats, which might be the revolutionaries, the radicals and the insurrectionists, and kill them. Now, what is a faithful servant of the White Hats for any sovereign state in a generic form? It's the pilots who fly them around the world. So the pilots that flew Clinton to Europe <clears throat> and subsequently in his journeys between Sheraton hotels, including the one in Port Douglas in Queensland, would presumably know exactly what Clinton was up to with his partnership for peace and the Sheraton Hotels. So my suggestion is, Phil, that those pilots are actually the ones that survived this man-in-the-middle attack. And the pilots who know what Clinton is up to and threaten to expose it are targets. Now, they don't necessarily have to be American civilian or military pilots. They can, of course, be the pilots who, in the great majority of the cases, I believe have a great and abiding affection for the United States of America because so many people like to come to the United States either for training or to live. <clears throat> One such pilot, of course, was a man by the name of Andreas Lubitz, who uh, qualified under the FAA flight training program or sponsored training program to fly these uh, aircraft, uh, Airbus aircraft, presumably, and simulator. And the people who tracked him would be, presumably, the people in the Circo-operated National Visa Center set up by your sister. So Lubitz would have been seen, my guess is, field as a disturbed patsy who could be used in a remotely controlled assassination to point the finger, well, I don't know, at white pilots who go crazy 
and kill everyone around them. And of course, it was uh, pretty persuasive, apparently, because two papers or tabloids, one De Bilt in Germany described him either the day or two days after that crash in the southern French Alps as De Amok pilot, which basically means he's crazy. And the Daily Mail described him as the killer co-pilot. Now, the problem, of course, is that De Amok pilot, or the killer co-pilot, Andreas Lubitz, when you listen to him, or what passes as him, with the voice cockpit recorder, you can sense that the man has been tranquilized. And the pilot, the more experienced pilot, who had gone to the washroom, apparently, was outside in the passenger cabin, allegedly knocking on the door. I think I'd inferred from you that he was probably wearing, it doesn't really matter because they can't prove us wrong, the portable oxygen supply, whereas the passengers, including Yvonne Selleck, a senior geospatial intelligence expert at the Pentagon, they were all silent for about five minutes. So you have the co-pilot tranquilized in the cabin, the pilot carrying a portable oxygen unit, and the passengers asleep in the cabin. So we've got a very nice situation where the dog is not barking. Because the dog, that is the Yvonne Selex in the world and the other passengers inside the passenger cabin, apparently they only wake up after the air had been cleared through the automatic systems on that plane about 30 seconds before impact. So you have actually an exquisitely timed mass murder where every indication is, and I believe they, that plane was tagged by French Mirage jets, probably under the Partnership for Peace information sharing arrangement. And it was Clinton's Partnership for Peace or their aircraft that must have hacked that plane, flown allegedly flown by Andreas Lubitz, to deliver a precise crash where they would have been able to time the death of Yvonne Selleck because a camera at the back of the seat in front would have been pointed at her face as she came to about 20 seconds before impact. Whether she was one of the screamers, I don't know, but uh, the passenger cabin woke up collectively they started screaming. It's very troublesome to anyone who cares about this kind of thing. And her face, with one backhauled image, would have been time-stamped alive. <clears throat> the second image, when the camera on the back seat on the plane hit the mountainside at 430 miles an hour, would have gone blank. So the online assassination betting pool would have been able to deduce precisely the time at which she died and scoop the pot and share it with the people who killed her. And the only party that could have had any precision as to the time of death is the world's largest air traffic controller with custody of the onion router network by which these 8A companies communicate with each other in order to support online assassination betting and the murder of military and civilian pilots who might otherwise blow the whistle on the Sheraton-Clinton conspiracy to destroy the Republic. Over to you, Phil. You mean scrap? Scrap. Yeah, or the way I like to pronounce out is S-crap. Um, it's sort of like s cargo, but different. You do know what escargo is, don't you, David? Uh, yes, Field. It's uh, actually I was uh, sharing a room 
uh, with my buddy at boarding school and my father took me out for curried snails and the tragedy is my buddy had asthma. So when I came back from my first exposure to curried, uh, not uh, uh, what See, do they call it? Uh, snails, I, I passed wind. Oh, and I, I triggered I triggered an asthma attack on my friend and nearly killed him. So I do know what escargots are, but um, I have mixed emotions about them. Uh, did your friend? He wasn't holding a lit match at the time. I hope uh, it wasn't anywhere near the part that emitted the gases. Yes, because that could launch you into outer space if the volume of the uh, gaseous material was high enough uh, in octane and also profuse enough in volume and knowing how you run on uh, at the mouth when you're making a simple point like Serco did it, you can spend 20 minutes tiptoeing around that. It's just more efficient say Serco did Malaysia 370. I know firsthand that Malaysia wanted to blame it on Boeing and I told a certain attorney in Malaysia who shall remain nameless that uh, if it's going to be a $1 trillion lawsuit against Boeing, they're going to have a $2 billion witness named Field McConnell. That conversation took place, and it took place at a beach about two, two and a half hours west of Kuala Lumpur. In fact, uh, let's, say, let's say 115 miles west of Kuala Lumpur on the southern coast of Malaysia, would people that enjoy searching for stuff try to help me remember what the name of that beach community is? It's roughly two hours west of Kuala Lumpur on the southern shore, and I think it either starts with S or P. But uh, sick of circle. Yeah, swamp, so are we all. Okay, David, uh, enough about your... Uh, the wayward wind is a restless wind, a restless wind that yearns to wander. And I was born the next of kin, the next of kin to David's escargo wind. David, over to you. Well, that's very lyrical, Field. I congratulate you. That's what I, you know, I am a cunning linguist. Okay, so. I suppose, I don't know if our uh, regular listeners have got any faith left in this Clinton scumbag, but um, here's an interesting article. Um, scam artists or grifters play their victims use, using well-established formulas backed by words of magical thinking, cynical techniques to enrich themselves at the expense of individuals or of society or both. And this is Carl Smith in the New York Post. Thank goodness then for Peter Schweitzer and his blockbuster expose Clinton Cash, the untold story of how and why foreign governments and businesses helped make Bill and Hillary rich, very rich. The pair have made at least $136.5 million since 2001. So we are talking about really an unimaginably corrupt couple who should never have been allowed in the White House in the first place and properly treated, whether under RICO or under unlawful belligerence, I would suggest, it should have been in front of a firing squad or on death row a long time ago. But uh, my opinion doesn't count. America has to wake up. Wait a minute. Details... Did, did you just say a long time ago? A what time ago? Didn't you just say a long time ago? Did I? Yeah, because that brings up a song. I'll only give you enough so you can recognize my my lyrical recall. A long, long time ago, I can still remember when the newspapers made us laugh. And I, anyway, bye-bye, Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee, and the levee was dry. Good old boys were drinking whiskey and rye, singing this will be the day that David Hawkins releases a lethal curried escargot flato bomb. David, over to you. Thanks. You're welcome. The details of the Clinton Foundation operation vary. So, um, one, dodgy rich businessman, often a foreigner in the middle of a mega deal in some corrupt country, possibly one run by a dictator, 
writes a check that buys him the status of a friend of Bill Clinton, FOB. The check is payable to the Clinton Foundation or Bill himself as an honorarium for a meaningless idealistic speech that is essentially a homily at a warehouse, a whorehouse. Do you know what a homily is, Phil? No, but isn't that a, and I'm being serious and I'm not, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but isn't that some form of a religious song? And I think it's associated with the Catholic Church, isn't it? Uh, a homily, I think it's normally meant to uh, in praise of or something like that, oh. homage. Oh, sort of like this song. He can turn the tide and calm the angry sea. He alone decides who writes the symphonies. Over to you, David. Yeah, so two, when the cameras are turned off, <laughs> Bill receives ultra luxurious travel. And the allegation there would be primarily through the Sheraton hotel chain. And just to remind folks, Sheraton was bought by the ITT group way back when, the ITT conglomerate. And ITT provides technologies for what are known as imputing ad hoc waypoints into aircraft. So it would be natural for ITT to equip the presidential suites in Sheraton hotels with the means of imputing ad hoc waypoints in aircraft where either the pilot or one or more of his or her passengers needed to be whacked in order to remove any obstacles to Bill and Clinton, Bill and Hillary's career or journey to the White House, and more recently, um, Barack Obama and Michelle. So, too, when the cameras are turned off, Bill receives ultra luxurious travel on someone else's dime through the Sheraton Hotel network and attends a lavish party in his honor held by some dictator or shady businessman connected to the new FOB. Talks go on behind closed doors. So the allegation would be that the conspiracies are developed in the presidential suite of the Sheraton Hotel, maybe the one in Kuala Lumpur, maybe at Sheepol Airport, or maybe the Gateway Hotel where you stayed at in Toronto. And, and what, was, what was I doing in Toronto and when was it? I can't remember the exact day, but you were on your way to go and do a simulation on that uh, Boeing 777 um, fixed platform simulator, I believe, about a mile from the airport. Yeah, it's actually on, it's just outside the airport uh, property, and the name of the uh, simulator company was UFly, and uh, they wouldn't let us take a camera in. And it is certainly possible that our mission <clears throat> to record <clears throat> uh, the, the way that uh, Malaysia 370 was electronically taken by Serco at BITOD intersection, it's quite possible that there were people allegedly working with us who were in fact working against us because uh, the <clears throat> CNN people had bought up the simulator time for the next 90 days, as I recall. And I was there, oh, just a week or two weeks after that phony baloney uh, <clears throat> pilot wannabe demonstrated some stuff to a CNN reporter, sort of like the pervert from CNN, and I can't remember his name, but do you remember the name of the pervert from CNN, uh, David, that was in the cockpit with the co-pilot of Malaysia 370 just a week or two before 370 went down? No, I've forgotten. I can't remember it either, and that's the perfect time to demonstrate the speed and lethalness of our chat room. Watch this. It's, I'm going to go. I'm going to go hit it when my watch hits uh, fourteen twenty-seven and forty seconds, and we'll time it. Hit it. Somebody out there is about ready to find the name of the uh, pedophile, uh, homosexual CNN reporter that was in the cockpit uh, with the co-pilot about two weeks or 10 days or one week before 370 was taken by Serco at my time. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And I'll bet you that guy, whoever he is, stayed at the Sheraton Gateway Hotel at the airport, just like you did. And my prediction is that there will have been a matrix of presidential suites at these hotels where the input intelligence included 
the tracking of Field McConnell on his way to set up that simulator or operate it. And they decided they had to, at all costs, to prevent. I mean, they didn't. I think they didn't want to kill you. Otherwise, they would have done because it would have draw too much attention because you were too close into the matrix. You know who was but it, had, David? Who was it that had an opportunity to kill me? Uh, well, I think that that reporter, um, the you know the guy in the um, the simulator. Oh, okay. Go yeah. Go ahead. I was just a little lost. I was cleaning my fingernails. Right, because remember what they've done with MH370 is they've developed a script in advance of the war games that Matthias Chang was kind enough to alert us to, which from memory was called uh, Cobra Gold and Cope Tiger. And Cobra Gold and Cope Tiger would have all have used the Eurasian command and control systems provided by the PFs for peace and NATO. So it's entirely plausible that the people who wrote the script for those two phony war games would have scripted in the remotely controlled assassination of the pilot of MH Flight 370 and the 20 free-scale semiconductor folks that specialized in stealth technology. Now, of course, they can play it either way. They can take the plane over, fly it to Diego Garcia, kill the pilot, and just sit him in the cockpit waiting for the automatic takeoff, and tell the 20 free-scale semiconductor people, I believe there were 12 Malays and 8 Chinese, or the other way around, <coughs> that they had a choice because they were going to be killed one after the other and the survivors would have an opportunity to witness one through 20 of their members being killed. And when a group of semiconductor, free-scale semiconductors cried uncle, they would have been given, let's say hypothetically, $2 million each and a new identity to fly to the production center in China, where Bill had uh, helped set up with John Shalakashvili a production unit for the Chinese People's Liberation Army to develop the stealth technology necessary for one or more of the future attacks planned for the United States of America. So, when the cameras are turned off, Bill receives ultra-luxurious travel on someone else's dime and attends a lavish party in his honor, held by some dictator or shady businessman connected to the new FOB. Talks go on behind closed doors. Three. Millions of dollars of donations start flowing into the Clinton Foundation from the FOB, that's the Friend of Bill, and associations. Now, I think, Field, and we are very close, I think, to proving it, that these Clinton Foundation meetings behind closed doors in Sheraton hotels are essentially to create online assassination betting pools where the people who donate into the Clinton Foundation identify a target, which might be the pilot of Flight 370, or the passengers, the 20 free-scale employees, and allows the bettors in this betting pool to place a certain amount of money and predict the time of death of those passengers, either the free-scale semiconductor people or the pilot of the plane itself. And the people who scoot the pot are the ones who can predict most closely the actual time of death. So I imagine in a hangar on Diego Garcia, the low value targets would probably have just been shot, but they wanted to uh, provide a little more convincing form of persuasion to the high value free scale semiconductor employees. So I visualize them being sat down on the ground in the hangar beside the plane and then having a plastic bag put over the head, a transparent plastic bag over the head of the first one of the 20. And uh, their death throes would be filmed by a camera inside the hangar. Those images would be backhauled to the United Kingdom, to the custodian of the snuff film archive 
uh, bets would be taken on when the vital signs of the individual being suffocated would disappear. And the party closest, and we could be talking seconds or less likely minutes, when those vital signs disappear, the individual is technically dead, and the party who predicted closest collects the pot and splits it with the bookmaker. So who would be the bookmaker for such a disgusting series of crimes? Ladbrokes. Exactly. There is only one. And in 1888 um, or 1886, the Ladbrox Root Company was formed to place money for the aristocrats of White's Club on the number of lengths between the first and second horses. So they were spot fixing back then, Phil. Again, if you can nobble the horse or nobble the jockey, or more recently, nobble the pilot, you can, of course, deliver a very precise, well, in the case of the horses, it's the number of lengths between the horses as they cross the finishing line. In the case of the pilot, it can be the second or millisecond at which the Captain Gerald de Conto and your classmate, U.S. Naval Academy alumnus, uh, Captain Chick Burlingham, are killed or perceived to be killed. And as we've covered extensively, Phil, we know the exact second when they were killed according to the date stamp and the time stamp on the images taken by a camera outside the Pentagon as the U.S. Naval Academy was blown up by people in the Pentagon City Sheraton Hotel directly across the Pentagon lawn. If I were to say 1737, how many seconds should I add to that? 19. I'm just testing you. Do you know what day we re we reported this to the feds? I forget, Phil. Uh, most people do. It was on the 10th of December at 21.59 and 10 seconds. I reported this crap to Michael Huerta's a predecessor, the drunk Randy Babbitt. <clears throat> uh, gave it to the FBI in Minneapolis. They didn't do anything. So what I do now is I use the FBI in Milwaukee. They're more responsive. There's one more FBI office that's very responsive. And because they're very responsive, if I were to identify them, that would not help them. So I'll just keep that one in my hip pocket. Over to you, David. And for Swap, I saw your big red button, but I think we're going to go for a few more minutes. So we'll wait till David's done. Go ahead, David. Yeah, OK. So thanks, Phil. So what we have is the Sheraton Hotel are providing presidential suites to link these online assassination betting pools with the technology that allows them to impute an ad hoc waypoint into an aircraft where the pilot or one or more of the passengers represent a threat to the conspiracy, which involves writing scripts for phony war games where corrupt politicians like the Clintons and the Harpers in Canada and the Camerons in the United Kingdom can maintain their grip on power or as they give way through forces that are unstoppable, make sure that their replacements maintain the conspiracy and protect it from whistleblowers. And it's actually a very, very effective technique because all people of influence at some time or other stay in an upmarket hotel by definition and leave that hotel to go to an airport where they're flown to a meeting such as the NATO conference in Chicago in 2012 at the Sheraton Chicago and meeting behind closed doors, those individuals can be warned what happens if they try and blow the whistle. And what happens of course is they're tracked in the hotel, they're tracked at checkout, very precise time, they're taken to the airport, they check in at the departure lounge, so that that time is precise. As the plane leaves the dock, that is, I understand, out of dock, they then go to off the runway, on the runway, and back into the dock. So there's a series of 
precise times, the most precise is when it actually happens, of course, but there's a predicted time for, let's say, takeoff from the runway. And there is an opportunity for the online assassination betters to identify the second at which the individual who's being tracked dies. And of course, as it starts its takeoff on the runway, it can be hit by another plane. Now, who would be able to steer one plane into another while they're taxiing or landing on the runway? Obviously, the world's largest air traffic controller. How precise they could be? Well, they could be precise within a few nanoseconds because Serco operates the National Physical Laboratory's atomic clock, which loses or gains a second in 158 million years. So coming back to the strategic way of destroying this team, field is all the United States Navy has to do is to take back control over the onion router, which it invented and implemented, and Hillary Clinton patented to try and remove it from their control, and declare that all of the most accurate clocks have to be guarded by Marines, I would suggest. And anyone trying to insert a more accurate timing signal into the United States military chain of command, forget the politicians, is an unlawful belligerent who can be killed through open fire anywhere in the world. And one of the first organizations to be taken over, and it's uh, what I call a flank attack, where Cameron will not be expecting, is the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington in the United Kingdom because that's where the most accurate clock in the world is, and that provides the GPS timing signals that allow the, through triangulation, the precise location for a spot-fixing murder or assassination of any pilot anywhere in the world. Over to you, Phil. Did you say Tetherington? Tetherington. Uh, watch how good our chat room is. Uh, Liverish peasant, afterburner, Denise C., Doug M., or VP, if VP's here, or Sarah A., could somebody please uh, find the distance from Heathrow Airport to whatever town David said? Teddington? Teddington. Yeah. You know, I'm going to England again pretty soon, David, right? Right. Maybe I should just drive up there to the National Physical Laboratory. Yeah, and commandeer it. Can't military people do that? I, well, if I had a uh, letter of Mark, do you know what that is? Uh, yeah, I think I explained that to you way back. Well, try spelling it, hotshot. M-A-R-Q-U-E. Okay, and it's Mark and what? Mark and seizure. No, Mark and reprisal. <laughs> That's what you get for... See, what you do, since you got the first one right, I had to figure out how to get you. But, yeah, letters of mark and reprisal, for those people who have not heard of it, it's still a legal instrument. And if one single congressman gives me a letter of mark and reprisal, I can go over and I can claim the National Physical Laboratory for the United States of America. And how could I, I arrest? That's What's that? Brilliant. That's what? absolutely brilliant. And specifically, you could claim the clock. Yeah. And uh, do you remember, David, uh, probably a year ago or so, we had Operation Top Cock? Yes. Okay, watch how fast. Uh, would someone please find the image that comes up if you go to Google Images and you put in Operation Top, T-O-P, Cock, C-O-C-K, plus Agent Chips, plus Pastel, plus I-O-C, uh, because Operation Top Cock uh, was going to try to seize some property from the Prince Fardingham Fowl family. Uh, and that may offend you, but that's okay. Uh, not that I offend you, but see, sometimes uh, I have to be sort of direct in my offensive uh, linguistics to cause these people to make a fatal error. David, over to you. Yeah, I think so. No, I just I'm um, doing... Um 
quick uh, run in my imagination around how that might work, but I love the idea of being focused on two specific items. And um, just to help you and your marine team with the letters of mark and reprisal, I put up an image of the atomic clock, the cesium fountain clock, at the National Physical, Pro Physical Laboratory in Teddington that would have been used field for the assassination of JFK. And um, here's another image, which is the latest version of the clock, which would have been used in the assassination of uh, Mr. Lubitz and the pilots on MH370, the pilots of uh, MH17, the pilots of American 1777, and the Baker's Dozen. Why don't you, before we go off the air, um, just run through the Baker's Dozen, because I would argue, or I think we could plausibly argue, that this latest version of the clock allowed them to spot fix the assassinations of the pilots of those Baker's Dozen aircraft. Why don't you just do a quick rerun a re resume of the uh, aircraft uh, that were felled under the Baker's Dozen? Over to you, Phil. Yeah, and that's going to cause, I'm going to have to keep score because I, I want to see if I can, I don't think I can get them all in order, but I think I can get all 13 and I'll write them down and I'll show you as I write them down. Uh, the first one was Adam Air 574, and that was on 1107. So as you can clearly see, Adam Air 574, 1107. By the way, Baker's Dozen means 13. Uh, so there's going to be 13 flights if I can get them all. And I don't care if I can get them all. Because long before I get them all, somebody will post them. Uh, let's see, Kenya Airways 507 on 5507. Kenya Airways 507 is next. I believe Speedbird, I'm just going to put speed, uh, SB, Speedbird 38. I believe that was in February of 08. Next one, as I recall, would be Turkish 1951. Uh, that was, I think, also in February of 08. I could be wrong on that because Colgan 3407 was in there, and Colgan 3407 uh, was in February, and that's where uh, Beverly Eckerd uh, got turned into some. Uh, Let's just stop while I'm ahead. Beverly Eckert, her life was taken wrongfully uh, by Barack Obama. Okay, Adam Air 574, Kenya 507, Speedbird 38, Colgan 3407, Turkish 1951. Uh, that brings us right up to June 1st. I'm going to write that Air France 447. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I got six out of 13. Uh, after Air France 507, that was June 1st of 2009, uh, then we have one that most people forget about, Air Africa, and that's very hard to spell. Could somebody please, oh, i got to check and see what's going on here. Ah, good. It's posted. Who did that? Agent 66. Thank you very much. I'll read them. Uh, Adam Air 574, Kitty Airways 507, Colgan 3407, Air France 447, Speedbird 38. Here I was at Air Africa uh, 771, and it's spelled A F R I K I Y A H. Uh, the deal there, and somebody that likes to go Google enable danger images can find out that I was being interviewed on Father's Day of 2010 at uh, Gatwick's airport at the Oxford Simulator Facility, Oxford Flying Training. I had lunch, or either lunch, or might have been my afternoon, late afternoon meal, at uh, something house. It's not Glyphase, that's in Wales. Oh, Goff Manor, G-O-F-F, -F, Goff's Manor Home. I think that's the name of the restaurant, but if you just put in uh, G-O-F-F -F restaurant plus Crawley, it'll come up. So let me go back to reading these, and thank you, whoever did it, which is Agent 66, known as the Malaysian Persuasion. Turkish 1951, that was at Schiphol, Amsterdam. Uh, Sukhoi Superjet, which ingratiated me into the Russians, which uh, is a good place to be because I think Russia is currently winning the chess game. Uh, next, we have Malaysia 370, Malaysia 17, 
which I predicted on the 29th of March of 2014. And am I, am I doing that to be egotistical? No, it's called drip, 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 and pretty soon they drowned. Uh, QZ8501, Asia Air, I missed it because it moved, Asia Air 235, GW9525, and GW9525 uh, is currently, did we just have a crash again, David? Did I forget one? I don't think so. Uh, uh, um, no, mine's blank. No, I don't think so. We, we've had some military crashes recently. Uh, sometimes they're caused by competing militaries like, uh, watch this for recall, Brian Bew. Brian Bew, B-E-W, was flying a CF-18 at Lethbridge, Alberta, uh, when somebody manipulated the FADEC on his right engine, causing him to select afterburner on the operating engine number one, which put him into an uncontrollable yaw to the right, and he punched out, and he, he, he probably more than most living people really appreciates ejection seats because he was within a second or two of being dead. Uh, and I don't find it very funny that Beverly Eckert would be killed by the baker's dozen or that my college classmate Chick Burlingame was killed by the baker's dozen. Ah, see, it has 13, right? I never include the other four in the baker's dozen because I don't know what you call 17 donuts, whereas I do know 13 is a dozen. But the uh, the events of 9-11, all four of those aircraft, uh, which in the order of their destruction was American 11, United 175, American 77, and United uh, 93. Just so we're clear, the first three aircraft went to Whiskey 386 Alpha Airspace, where Quint 25, Quint 26, and Quint 27, flown by Brad Derrick, Craig Bjorkstrom and Dean Ekman were denied entry, and then they returned uh, and they saw a smoking hole in the Pentagon, which was not my college classmate Chip Burlingame or his uh, Boeing 757. It was a Raytheon drone, and Raytheon drone A3s were uh, something that has a relationship to John Lumpjaw, short pothead McCain, who is guilty of treason. Now, has he been adjudicated guilty? No, nope, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean he's not guilty of treason. He is guilty of treason. Want to prove it? Google my name, his name, treason, with a side order, Tim Plenty. Okay, David, back to you. But I, uh, all the uh, Baker Dozen aircraft uh, were listed, and uh, fortunately, that's, that's the end of the story, and it is Goff's Manor. Uh, someone put a picture there, Agent 66 again. She's got a set of hot fingers on her, her mouse or whatever she's using. Um, so Swamp's leaving, 66, and Jake will have to take over. David, over to you. Okay, so I just read a, a paragraph, and I think this is a theatrical document. It's not real because it's got dates and scope uh, wrong. But letter of Mark, William III, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland. Interesting piece of theater, that. Defender of the faith, etc. To our trusty and well-beloved Captain Robert Kidd, commander of the Adventure Galley with a crew of 80 men and mounting 30 guns. Greetings. Whereas we are informed that Captain Thomas II, John Ireland, Captain Thomas Wake, and Captain William Mays, or Mace, and other subjects, natives or inhabitants of New York and elsewhere in our plantations in America have associated themselves with diverse others, wicked and ill-disposed persons, and do against the law of nations commit many and great piracies, robberies, and depredations on the seas upon the parts of America and in other parts uh, to the great hindrance and discouragement of trade and navigation. And uh, on it goes, Field, but wouldn't it be ironic if the letters of Mark that were presumably signed by the king in the UK to take out various targets in the United States wouldn't that be interesting if that was turned around by Lieutenant Colonel Field McConnell with letters of Mark? And we have discussed this at length in some of the previous books. But I think now we've got a very good definition of the thing to be taken under letters of Mark and reprisal. And that's the, the clock at the National Physical Laboratory. With that clock field, 
the United States Navy can become the preeminent military force, and I would suggest the United States Navy's officers are purged of the guys who've been helping Clinton, and you use the United States Navy as the catalyst to restore the Republic to its rightful conditions as one of the, the light on the hill. Is that the, is that the phrase? Beacon on the hill, and you know what? We could do this literally overnight. Uh, for instance, instead of being a lieutenant colonel retired, what if I were a five-star general active, which would put me in a position senior to, I'm just going to name three of the guilty four-star generals that I would probably uh, send to uh, a destination in Kansas. Martin Dempsey, first and foremost, just because of the sloppy nature of his work, uh, Martin Dempsey, and by the way, there's 30, there are 30 flag officers who have been identified to me as being treasonous. Some of them are real easy to find because they got Knights of Malta in their name, which of course is a violation of whatever resolution that was. Excuse me, your dog's barking, but tell your dog not to look at his watch. Um, the, the generals that I would nominate to be the first three to go, and I think the other 27 would self-eliminate, uh, would be Dempsey, Petraeus, and uh, D, 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 G87 Opie. Oh, okay, G87 Opie. Where have you not heard that before? Well, the guys who signed off on the murder, uh, some would say wrongful death, and uh, they're welcome to call me at 001715-307-8222, if any of these generals that I identify, if they don't like being identified for what they've truthfully done, you can call up and I'll tell you to get in line at 401 Main Street and kiss my ass. Um, Dempsey, Petraeus, McChrystal, and G87 Opie. To find out who G87 Opie is, Google G87, no space, just G87, diagonal OPIE, Opie, plus Obama, plus Panetta, plus Martin Dempsey, plus Thomas Rickard, R-I-C-K-A-R-D. Uh, these people that I just rattled off, uh, the group of five, they're the ones that authorized the hit on extortion 17. And you know what? Um, anyone who hits good people like the SEALs aboard extortion 17 should not be surprised when they get hit back. And sometimes you don't see it coming. David, over to you. Yeah, fine, uh, Phil. So it's um, 12.55, we covered a lot of ground, but I do love that idea of uh, uh, letters of mark and reprisal. It squeezes them out of uh, Congress or Senate, whatever, and you just go for the clock and you basically dismantle the conspiracy because they can't synchronize the assassinations of the pilots and crew and passengers who stand between them and absolute power. Over to you. I got a really good idea. Go ahead. Why don't you write a draft of an extremely short letter from me uh, to Michael Huerta and just, I don't, not one of your ad nauseum run on whatevers, like maybe five bullet statements and I'll send it via certified mail where Michael Huerta has to um, receive it. He has to, someone has to sign for him. Uh, and as long as I'm sending it to him, I will send a copy to General Joseph Dunford, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who is scheduled to become the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when the uh, uh, deliverance banjo player named Martin Dempsey, uh, treasonous, uh, at least two counts that I know of, three, I just thought of a third count of treason against Martin Dempsey. Uh, but anyway, when Dempsey goes and surely he finds a cush place in the military industrial complex, well, he'll be play, paid mega bucks until he dies, which isn't necessarily a good deal. Alexander Haig was paid uh, mega bucks after 9-11 for his participation in 9-11 and he became a billionaire and guess what if you go to his grave you know like if you really have a bad case of uh, 
runaway bladder and you got to void your bladder and you go out to Alexander Haig's uh, grave to uh, void your bladder, you will see that he doesn't have a wallet or an ATM uh, on his headstone. So selling your soul to the devil uh, might be a short time fix, but it's an eternal burden. David, over to you. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I, I'll work on that. Um, maybe I could uh, draft up uh, a letter, a proposed or a draft a letter of market reprisal for consideration by Joseph Dunford, where you become the deputy agent entitled to fly over to London and confiscate the clock. Actually, you don't need to confiscate it. You just put some Marines around it and tell, uh, you know, that useless prick um, Cameron to see if he can take it away again. But once that clock is in your hands or in the Marines' hands or in the custody, if you will, of uh, Joseph Dunford, it's all, o it's all over. Well, we can do it virtually, you know. True. Do you know what would you know what the name of the operation is that I'm going to England on? And I believe I'll be leaving on Wednesday the 29th of July. But do you remember what the name of the operation is, David? Uh, no, Phil. Operation Hot Kitchen. Uh, I want to get everybody to take their... Um, That's an all-new season on Key and Peele. Tonight at 10 on Comedy Central. That's funny. Do you hear that, David? Yeah. I don't know how that happened. I didn't do that. But... Somebody must have just put up a YouTube and uh, got over here. Don't worry, Jake, the buffering will quit. Uh, Agent 66 put up, uh, this is, this once again, uh, wait a minute, I got a Bible right here. I, I swear this is not arrogance or pride. It's just evidence of how things are meant to be. Take a look at this accident incident report, David. Do you see it there next to Agent 66's name? It says Operation Manual Part A, Air Safety Report. Hang on, Phil. I've got to go to the chat room, and then I want to do something before we shut down. Okay. So what am I looking at? Underneath the picture of uh, a, there's a picture, and then there's uh, Doug M saying dueling banjos, and then Agent 66 has an Aristana form. Oh, yeah, I got it. Okay, it's hard to read. If you blow it up, it makes it easy to read. I didn't fill this form out. The co-pilot did because he was such a chicken. <clears throat> Somebody tried to kill us, uh, which reminds me, keep trying. Uh, you can't kill people if they are protected by Isaiah 54, 17, and you're wasting your time to even bother. But anyway, here's somebody that tried to uh, silence someone. And basically, the details don't really matter, but I believe it was the 13th or the 8th of December of 2008. Maybe it was the 13th. It's on that form. Who knows? Uh, and you can see my name, uh, McConnell, 6186, then something like uh, Shash Beatty, and then uh, the flight attendant or purser, whose name I can't read, uh, she was a Russian. He was a Russian. Uh, she'd been a... Val, I'm not making this up. She'd been a ballerina at the Moscow Ballet before she probably got tired toes and was put out to... Uh, she was the oldest flight attendant I flew with at Aristana. She was 32. Um, anyway, enough about her. Uh, at 100 knots on takeoff on a moderately contaminated runway uh, at night in moderate snowfall and uh, X amount of wind, the protocol is the pilot flying, which was the co-pilot, Eddie, uh, he pushes the power up uh, to, first he pushes it up to stabilize it, then he puts it into the uh, auto throttle detent for uh, uh, takeoff. And then if you, if you need the performance, you can go to geo, what is it, toga, takeoff and go around thrust, which is the next detent up. And then the FADEX, will give you the proper balance of all sorts of parameters and give you the power you're asking. And then what the uh, the pilot, not flying, that was me, once he sets the power, I'd say thrust normal. Okay, then the next thing I'm supposed to do is at 100 knots, I'm supposed to say 100 knots. The idea being he has his eyes out of the cockpit and I have my eyes in the cockpit as the pilot, not flying. And then the next thing I'm supposed to do is to announce V1 and rotate, which are the speeds. V1 is the precise speed where you can either stop or go with a loss 
of one engine in a two engine aircraft. Um, so if you're below V1 and you lose an engine, you have to stop. Good luck sometimes. Like slippery runway, probably better off going. Uh, how could you possibly do that legally? Ah, what happened? I'll set it up. It's called gamesmanship. They don't teach us anymore. The airplane would be going down the runway and the pilot not flying would say thrust at 138 knots, an engine would quit. And so the pilot flying might get nervous and say, we lost an engine. At which point I say V1 rotate after we lost an engine. Nobody can prove that I heard it. Uh, you, it's very important to know the rules, but it's even more important to know how to apply the rules to make sure that the passengers in your care are safe. So anyway, David, what happened here on this day, uh, we go down the runway, I say thrust normal, I say uh, 100 knots, then I take a look outside just to check on the runway alignment and I see that we're airborne. We're airborne at just beyond 100 knots when the B1 rotate call was going to be about 140. So it's amazing we were not killed. We should have been. Uh, but something caused us not to die. And I'll stop right there. But if anybody ever meets me in person and there's at least two people, so it's there's two witnesses, I'll tell you every detail I can remember. And I can tell you why on that day of history we didn't die when it appears somebody really wanted us dead. David, over to you. Yeah, a couple of items, Phil. One is that I've just uh, checked that um, General Joseph Dunford attended uh, a Marine summit um, at the Sheraton Hotel in Arlington. Uh, I'll find a little more about that. Now, that doesn't make him guilty of anything. It's just that uh, if we're right that the Sheraton Hotel is operating a bait and switch operation around the world, then anyone, including a Marine general, can walk into that trap and come out of it either compromised or entrapped. So even the most uh, courageous and smartest individual is potentially vulnerable to this kind of thing. And then I'm about to put an image uh, inside the chat room field that I want you to take a look at and understand, and you probably know that already, that uh, Marines in uniform, it is a breach of protocol to be carrying an umbrella for a prick. Over to you. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't matter if it's a circumcised or uncircumcised, uh, white, black, or somewhere in between. And uh, one person in the chat room has said that the only watch more powerful than the cesium watch is my $10 Walmart. And so far, I'm saying that's probably right. Another breach of protocol, you see the candy man there, uh, Martin Dempsey? Do you see he's outdoors? Uh, let me just check. Yeah, in other words, the candy ass that's doing the cha-na-na or cha-cha-cha or the rumba. There's a yeah, army. Yeah, Okay, now notice his head. Now compare his head to the Marine's head. Do you see the Marine has a hat? Uh, I can't see a Marine in that image. Unless Look it's at the lower the image. Lower, just below Dempsey. Oh, yeah, that's the one I just put up. Yeah, okay, the Marine has a hat, right? Yes. Martin Dempsey does not have a hat, right? Right. Okay, they're both outdoors, so they should both have their hats on. So one of them is professional, that's the Marine, and the other one is a complete nincom boop, uh, poop, excuse me, which reminds me, do you know what poopery is, David? Poopery, I think, is the pronunciation, Phil. Yeah, you, I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I'm using, there are some ads on TV, um, are they TV? Yeah, they're TV, I think. But anyway, uh, you'll just, if you could ever go back and look at today's radio show ad, I think I put a, well, maybe I didn't, never mind. I put I put a YouTube in a couple shows ago. Okay, I'm ready to go whenever you are, but uh, however long you want to stay, I'll hang with you. No, no, it's uh, done. It's uh, 107. It's a good show, I think, and look forward to the next one. Yeah, and uh, Agent 66 said the reason we didn't crash is because uh, TWM PFP grabbed the wheel. Actually, the side stick controllers on an Airbus, like this would be the co-pilot. He has one in his right hand. This would be like the captain. He has one in his left hand. Or in the case of able danger for security purposes, you might have one in both hands. Hot sauce, that is. I don't know what you guys are thinking. So, yeah, we can call for the big red button. 
And um, I don't know if the music guru is here today. His name is Jorge Georgeworth. Oh, yeah, there he is, George Holdsworth. I'm sorry, I got my tongue twisted because I'm a living, uh, cunning linguist. So, David, whenever you want to leave, go ahead, and I'm asking for the big red button and or Georgie Porgy. Okay, I'm off dial. Bye-bye. If Teddington is going to get hit, I will certainly be wearing a hat. Uh, I think we should ask for a mark. There's the big red button. Uh oh, this is going to come right down to the, uh, I almost said something I'm glad I didn't say, right down to the, uh, let's see, the last couple of seconds. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Red Hots, Crystal Ship, that's a song by uh, Joseph M. says, awesome, David. Thank you. Oh, you're awesome, David, and I'm just thank you. I, yeah, well, that's okay. I've got, the, I've got the tin of mixed fruit drops by Cavendish and Harvey, and on my next trip to England, I've been put on notice that I might have some more. Let's follow the chat here. Bye, David. Excellent show. Oh, yeah, he gets excellent show. I get nothing. Bob S. Yeah, but you are being proved by an expert, Phil. Okay, oh, uh, Livery said, I thought Field had stopped. I've had nothing for the last 10 minutes. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, blessings and safe travels to Field. I'll take the blessings first, and I'll assume the safe travels, and I am assuming it because of Psalm 91, 11 to 14, and also the fact that I know what four digits uh, I can block KU band transmissions as long as my cell phone is not in the airplane mode. Hmm, wonder what that means. Hey, Bob S., uh, I'm glad you're here. I don't want you to think, Bob S., make sure I got my, yeah, it's Bob S., RCS, uh, Robert Simpson, Michigan. Uh, I may be going as early as tomorrow. It's actually late because I paid for that purse on the 8th of June, but uh, I may go and get it tomorrow. Uh, I may get it next week. Uh, there's a third possibility that Bucky Badger might get it for me, but there's reasons, uh, including paperwork and all that type of legal garbage, uh, it would be useful for me to be there. Okay, we got the big red button. This is a blessing for me. It's a blessing for us, too. And I, tell me how to re spell, uh, pronounce your name, Mukti. Is it Mukti or Mukti? It's M-U-K-T-I. And tell us what language that is. Silas, please thank the cat for me. Okay. Uh, I'm still praying regarding a therapist license at the ranch. Uh, we're just hoping to get the ranch, and then we'll staff it once we get it. But it's not just the United States. Crystal ships, the doors. The crystal ship is coming. In. Anyway, uh, did you know that the doors, lead singer Jim Morrison, his father was complicit in the Tonkin Gulf false flag. His father wasn't willingly and wittingly complicit. He was taken advantage of. Uh, how do I know this? Well, in 1966, every Wednesday of my senior year in high school, my father, uh, Glenn McConnell, would be at a meeting with Admiral George Morrison at Camp H.M. Smith in Hawaii. And, um, you know, what? Okay. what would, yeah, go ahead, David. Uh, I just put a picture. I think you'll love it in the chat room. Is it a couple of orangutans? <laughs> I get the expression on this clown's face. I know. And look at her and her tribal, well, I'm not sure it's a her. I've seen skinnier legs on, well, 300-pound linemen. I was a lineman for the county. Uh, nobody's that's, put, well, go ahead. That's what happens when you get a community organizer trying to go through a gate with an upturned umbrella. Well, of course, he doesn't know I'm the gatekeeper. David, what day did I, what day and year did I take an oath uh, that precedes my three military oaths? Do you recall? No. Yeah. Bet your age of 66 could find it, but I'll save her the work. If someone were to put in 14 February 1967 plus, plus oath plus my name, I think you'd find something, and you'd find something which would help people understand why it's so easy for us uh, you do most of the work, and of course I do the uh, thong slinging and the uh, drone snatching. But uh, these people, they don't know who they're engaged with, and uh, as opposed to they know exactly what they're betrothed to. Uh, and notice for the record, I didn't say anything about sloth in reference to the Sotero couple. 
Uh, so David, we got the big red button. I'm waiting for the three, two, one, push it. And uh, you know, if I were him, I'd, I'd roll that umbrella up and I'd use it as a lance. But anyway, that's up to me. Where do you think the lance should be placed, David? Uh, anatomically in a, a spot fixed zone. Yes, that's close enough for me also. Expression on which orangutan, both twins in crime. Don't forget I will need the numbers and equipment. Uh, numbers and equipment. Maybe for the clock. Are you David Beach or Sam the dog? Uh, first of all, I'm not sure I pronounced David Beach's last name right. I think it's Beach. B-E-I-T-S. Well, wait a minute. B-E-I-T-C-H. Uh, he lives over in the north in England, and he lives on, on a river where it's foggy. Uh, uh, David, do you want me to sing some more? Because it's taken forever to get the three, two, one, push it. And usually people well, will... Go ahead. Um, your singing can be quite painful, but uh, give it a shot. 